Hello, and welcome to our presentation on the Danube River and its surrounding watershed. The Danube is one of my favorite rivers in Europe, and I'm excited to share some of the fascinating features of this magnificent river with you. The Danube River flows through a massive watershed with the headwaters lying in Germany's Black Forest. The river flows in a generally easterly direction for 1,770 miles, or 2,850 kilometers, through nine countries before eventually draining into the Black Sea. This is the second longest river in Europe, only surpassed by the Volga. In addition to the main stem of the Danube, there are many large rivers like the Sava and the Tisa that drain a sizable watershed within the overall watershed. The overall size of the drainage basin is 801, 463,000 kilometers squared, or 309,447 square miles. This massive drainage area significantly influences both the water quality and quantity within the main stem of the river, which we will talk about at the end of this presentation. With such a massive watershed with so many contributing rivers, any discussion of the entirety of the watershed would take a really long time. Therefore, I'm going to focus on the main branch of the Danube River, which is indicated here by the blue highlighted line. I am not going to be spending any significant amount of time on the tributaries to the Danube, whether they be major or minor. However, I will touch upon some of the tributaries in passing as they contribute to water quality and quantity issues. There is also a watershed connection between the Danube River and the Main and Rhine rivers. This constructed canal links Eastern and Western Europe and breaks the dividing line between the Danube and the Main River watersheds. I will not be covering this canal in this presentation. Let's begin by looking at the region in which the river lies. One of the beautiful aspects of the Danube River is the diversity of landscapes through which the river flows. The river starts in the mountainous black forest of Germany where it collects rainwater and snowmelt as it carves its way through the mountains before draining into a wide flat plain of rich farmland. At the outlet of the river is one of the largest deltas in Europe that is home to an abundance of wildlife. When one travels the length of the river, the changing landscape makes for a fascinating journey. As the Danube is a huge system with many smaller rivers feeding into the main channel, it is almost an imperative that in order to understand the river, we break it into smaller parts. One way of doing this is to look at each of the sub-watersheds. We could start by looking at each smaller river that feeds into the larger channel and explore how the land forms the land use in that smaller sub-watershed influences the larger channel. For example, we could look at the Lech and how that contributes to the main channel. Then move on to looking at the Izar. And then we move downstream and look at the Inn. And so on, all the way to the Black Sea. I have marked out many of the major rivers, and if we were to do a comprehensive analysis, we would look at each of these rivers independently before we looked at how they contribute to the overall Danube system. However, for the sake of time, this is not what we are going to do. Rather, we are going to keep our focus on the main stem of the river and break this main stem into sections, or river segments. The Upper Danube River segment runs from the start of the river in the smallest tributaries in the Black Forest to where it joins with the Morava River near Bratislava. The Middle Danube River runs from the Morava River to the Iron Gates Dam complex on the border of Serbia and Romania. The Lower Danube runs from the Iron Gates region to the Delta. Finally, the Delta of the Danube River is the segment in which the river meets the Black Sea. One word of caution on my selection of river segments. There is not a universally accepted division of the river. If you do your own search of river segments, you will find different divisions. With such a large complex river, expect different perspectives, especially as we cross country boundaries. As we begin looking at the Danube, a good opening question is where does the Danube River start? While that is an easy question, the answer is anything but easy. Like all other rivers, the Danube River starts wherever there is a melting snowflake or a raindrop that falls and flows into a channel that leads into the Danube. So the Danube River starts all over the watershed. But that's not quite the answer you are probably looking for. 
Perhaps another way to look at where the river starts is to look at the perimeter of the larger watershed. Maybe the river starts at the edge of the watershed where the Danube is separated from other watersheds. Again, while this is true, it is probably not quite the answer you are still looking for. Okay, enough leading us up straight channels. I apologize in advance for my pronunciation. I'm not a native German speaker. The starting point of the Danube River is generally identified as being at the top of the Bregg River at St. Martin's Chapel in Wirtwangen im Schwarzwald. If one were to follow the Danube up to where it splits into smaller streams in the headwaters and follow the longest stream, which is the Bregg, one would come here. As with all the world's mightiest rivers, the source is often the smallest spring or tiny strange basin. This is one, re one reason rivers are so amazing. They start from the smallest source before becoming something awesome. When we look at the very early history of the forces that shaped the Black Forest region, we have both plate tectonics, in which the continental plates banged against each other, resulting in the uplifting of the underlying geography. In addition, we have intrusion of lava into the underlying stone that has deposited valuable mineral resources. These two ancient geological forces were shaped more recently by glaciation, in which a cap of snow and ice covered the region, softening the mountain peaks and shaping the valleys. These areas were shaped both by the grinding erosive force of the ice and the carving of the landscape by meltwater coming off the glaciers that carved the river valleys. The glaciers also left behind several glacial lakes that can be seen in the region today. In addition to shaping of the watersheds by the melting water and the scouring of sediment, as the glaciers retreated, they left behind tons of material and rock that served to shape the overall watershed. While glaciation contributed to a fairly rapid shaping of the mountains and valleys in the upper regions of the Danube Basin, there was water erosion that slowly shaped the uplands over time, carrying the mountains down to the valleys slowly, resulting in rich deposits of sediment in the lowlands. If you are going to go for a cruise on the Danube, here is a little trivia question that you can share with your future cruisers to impress them with your knowledge of European geology. While the surface water, which is when rain and snow fall on the ground and flow directly into the channel, flows into the Danube basin, when the water flows into the ground and meets the underlying rocky geology, this underground geology directs the flow of the water into the Rhine River basin. With this groundwater flow into the Rhine River, there is more water in the Danube headwaters that flows into the Rhine than goes into the Danube. Now that fact should impress your friends and fellow travelers. As the Danube flows through the Black Forest, it is a smaller river that is generally considered not navigable. It's only once the main stem of the Danube meets the in-river tributary that the river is considered suitable for significant transportation. This is where the smaller, cozy Danube begins to transition to the big Danube that captures our imagination and dreams. In the city of Passau, we see three rivers, the Inn, the Ilsa, and the Danube, merging into a big river. If one were to go to the spot where you can overlook the merging of these rivers, you can see how the landscape and land uses influence the quality of the river. Upstream geology and land uses contribute sediment, and in some cases pollutants, that will influence the color of the river. In this case, we can see the three different colors of the different rivers. Over time, these waters will merge and become the same color. However, until that merging happens, these different colors can persist for miles. If you travel along the river, I encourage you to look at each river junction to see how the incoming water influences the water in the main channel. The Danube River is a little bit of an odd river in that it repeatedly flows through different kinds of geology. The river alternates between flowing through deep gorges and then draining into flat basins, before flowing back into a steep gorge. Unlike many other rivers that start from alpine regions and transition to open floodplains, the Danube repeats this gorge, floodplain, gorge cycle, moving through different geologies along its lengths as it flows from the headwaters to the outlet. This pattern starts with the river flowing out of the Black Forest and draining into the Austrian plain, which is a generally flatter landscape with a wide river basin.
The upper portion of the Danube is a typical alpine river system where the water has a fairly rapid flow due to the steeper topography, a rocky riverbed due to the alpine geology, and cooler water temperatures. The middle Danube River is the largest segment of the main stem of the river. In the Bratislava region, the river enters a massive river delta where the steepness of the landscape decreases and water velocity slows substantially. As with most river basins, the region is productive farmland established through the erosion and deposition of upstream sediment. Toward the lower portion of the middle segment of the river, it flows back into the Iron Gate Gorge, where it flows through the Balkan and Carpathian mountain ranges. Unlike most other river systems, we have a river system that leaves a plain and re-enters a steep gorge. This is a beautiful transition zone if one is traveling on the river. The Lower Danube River transitions back into a traditional broad floodplain of rich agricultural land. The wide fields on both sides of the river and occasional poplar forest stands are a testament to the highly productive sedimentary deposition of material from further up the river. The lowest part of the Danube River is the Delta, where the river enters the Black Sea. This region of the river is defined by oxbow lakes, lagoons, and wetlands. This section of the river has seen substantial human-induced changes as the river and its floodplain have been channelized to increase the amount of agricultural land and to improve transportation to the Black Sea. The Danube River that we see today is not what humans would have encountered when they first came upon the river. Rather than the well-defined river channel tightly constrained between established and armored banks, they would have seen a much different and wilder river. The river that the first humans who came into the Danube River Basin would have seen was a wild river that migrated across a broad river basin. This river would flood regularly, with the high waters cutting new channels and re-establishing its course following every heavy rainfall. What was a broad, flat piece of land on one side of the river could easily disappear through erosion, find the river channel on the other side, or be completely cut off from the river as its course changed to another place in the landscape. This image of what a small section of the river would have looked like in 1715 shows the tremendous sinuosity of the river and the many smaller channels that would move with each rain event. In addition, there is a broad, soggy floodplain dominated by riparian, or river-influenced, flora and wetlands. As humans moved into the region, the first thing one notices about the Danube River is that from a land-based perspective, this is one heck of a barrier to movement. Crossing the river was a major problem. Our ancestors did not have the convenience of stable ships or bridges with which to cross the moving water. Even with our modern technology today, Crossing the river still creates substantial challenges. One way to cross the Danube is to swim it. However, the river currents are fast and one is never sure what is under the water. This story of saving the Romanian flag after the fall of a fort demonstrates how risky it was to swim across the river. Many people did not know how to swim and it was not an uncommon tactic to drive an enemy into the river with the intent of drowning one's opponents. So, swimming was not the most desirable way to cross the river. Another way to get people across the river was by ferrying them on ships. These ferries were a significant upgrade from swimming across the river. Now people and goods in significant number could cross the river on a regular basis. However, in historic time, river ferries were also constrained by flooding and the vagaries of what was carried by the river. A ferryman would not want to risk his ferry when the water was flowing too fast, and one could never be certain there was not a shallow submerged log floating down the river just waiting to snag the ferry and spin it uncontrollably downstream. Swimming across the Danube or taking a ferry was dependent on water depth and the speed of the current. These methods of crossing the Danube also limited the amount of goods and people crossing the river. Imagine if you are an invading army and want to get your troops across the river quickly. Or maybe you are a merchant with perishable goods needing to get to market on the other side of the river. Swimming or using ferries would just not do it. However, the Roman emperor who faced this problem was the first documented person to order the building of a bridge crossing the river. While this bridge no longer exists, one can still find the remains of the bridge piers in the lower portion of the river. 
While one can still find ferries that cross the Danube, there are also many newer bridges that one can use. The beautiful chain bridge that connects Budapest is only one example of a modern marvel that links both sides of the river. As one travels along the river and passes under the bridges, one should appreciate both the beautiful and the mundane bridges that have broken the barrier that was once the Danube. Imagine if all the traffic flowing across the bridge had to move by ferry. We would substantially see a different human community in this region. If one looks at this image of the river in 1715, you can see that the potential area of flooding was massive. This potential flooding not only drowned agricultural land, but also hindered the development of cities and commercial districts. Who wants to build their houses or commercial properties in areas that are going to be regularly flooded? Well, no one, or only people who can build nowhere else. Controlling flooding on the main stem of the Danube was one of the earliest significant modifications that humans made directly to the river channel. While this is an image from the Netherlands, it does show one of the first flood control practices that were installed along the Danube River. Starting in the 16th century, dikes were installed along the lower and middle portion of the river to keep floodwaters from spreading onto adjacent land. One of the challenges with putting these dikes in is that they can strain the water and increase the speed, which can cause challenges both upstream and downstream, such as increased flooding and more erosion. That is one of the challenges with managing a river. Human interventions may correct the problem at one location, but often move the problem to another point, upstream or downstream. The image on the left is a painting of the Vienna flood of 1838. The one on the right is a modern flood control dike in Vienna. As you can see, cities and nations are still dealing with the challenges of flooding to this day and we can expect to see continued efforts to manage high water in the river and to correct from problems arising from our solutions of the past. In addition to protecting the increasing number of people who live in the urban and rural areas adjacent to the Danube from flooding, the increasing usage of the river for shipping saw dramatic changes. If people were going to use the river to ship product up and downstream, one wanted to be sure the conditions were safe enough to do so. Back to this image of the river channel in 1715. You can see the river winds its way down the channel. There are also sandbars that will shift with the current and create navigational hazards as they are unpredictable being there one day and gone the next. No ship pilot wants to risk grounding his vessel on a sandbar. From a shipping perspective, this channel is a mess and highly risky to use for moving goods and people up and down the river. Better to go overland even if that takes a long time. So what do we do to improve the river for navigation and transportation? Well, of course, we build our own river channel. Rather than allowing the river to go where it wants to, we are going to force the river into a more defined course. As you can see in this image, while they have not drained all the land around the river, they have done a substantial effort to find a more unified channel that would be easier to navigate. As you think about the changes between the 1700s and 1800s, all of this work was done by people with shovel and other hand tools. River modification was a terribly expensive proposition that required massive labor, often conscripted labor from a nation's military. And here is the modern Danube Channel. It is a straighter, well-defined channel. There are some adjacent streams and smaller rivers to help with flood control, but you can see that the river now looks like a highway that makes transportation up and downstream easy. However, as with the changes related to flood control, channelization does things to the river. It speeds the flow of water, so water moves downstream more quickly, creating more downstream flooding. With the river being disconnected from its banks and moving faster, the faster flowing water cuts into the river bottom, deepening the riverbed. This incision of the riverbed is lowering the depth of the river in Vienna by a couple of centimeters per year. While this is not a lot in any given year, it does add up over time. And the sand was that, that was deposited in sandbars? It's still being carried downstream, but it creates an unpredictable river under the channel. When we were last on the Danube River, I asked our captain about the sediments in the river, and he said it moves back and forth across the channel on a daily basis. So pilots communicate where the primary channel is on any given day. So, while some of the unpredictability of the river has changed, there are still changes that are happening. They are just harder to see. 
If you have traveled a significant distance up or down the river, one of the common features that you will see are the locks and dams that both control flow and allow for easier travel through the main channel. Throughout its length, the Danube has 14 locks to ease navigation. Unlike surface transportation, where we have vehicles that can navigate over roads that can follow the landscape, river travel is different and has constraints that we need to modify if we are going to more easily move goods and people up and down the river. This would be the perfect river channel for navigation purposes. The river would flow downstream at a continuous slope that was predictable and had no variation. However, this is not what we see in natural rivers. In our natural river channel, our river will go over small waterfalls and pass through areas of shallow water. Even the smallest ships will have difficulty navigating these areas. So how do we get around these river obstacles? Remember, here is the perfect channel for transportation. Here is a more realistic view of the downhill slope of a river channel. As it follows the landscape, it will have different water flows where there are nice flat areas, and then there are rapid areas and sharper fall areas. If you were to take a ship up and down this river, the pilot would struggle in areas where the slope was steeper. So let's modify this channel to make transportation easier. We are going to place a system of three locks and dams in this section of the river to modify the characteristics of the channel, making it easier to navigate. With our new lock and dam system, we are creating a series of pools that ships can easily navigate. In order to move up and down the river, the ships will enter the lock system where they, where they will be lifted or lowered into the next dam pool and released to carry on their voyage. Overall, this is a fairly simple system that greatly increases the navigability of the world's rivers. However, there are some challenges with the system that we will discuss later. So far, we've spoken about some of the changes that humans have done to manage the main stem of the Danube River. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the impacts that humans have had outside of the main channel, but which have significant influence on the way the river functions. Within the larger Danube River Basin, there are more than 600 dams that constrain the flow of the river. Of these dams, there are 156 that provide electricity to those living within the basin and in the larger Eastern European area. Remember, this is our natural channel in which we've had varying slopes of water. With each of these slopes, the water will move at different speeds. Steeper slopes will naturally carry the water faster through the channel. Shallower slopes will have slower moving water. When we put in a dam, we change these dynamics. Rather than a series of lock and dam structures, we're going to put one big hydropower dam here. Now, we are going to have a pool where the water slows down. All that energy that was dissipated as the water worked its way down the channel is now captured behind the dam until it is released through the energy generation equipment. Because of their nature, dams tend to do two things to rivers. When the upstream water hits the pool of the dam, it will slow down. As the water slows down, it will drop the sediment it has collected upstream, depositing it in the pool of the dam. Below the dam, we now have fast-moving water that lacks any sediment load. This clean, fast water will be more erosive, so we would expect to see greater rates of erosion downstream of the dam. If the banks of the river are protected, we can expect to see the river carving sediment from the bottom of the channel until it hits bedrock. In a natural river, as the water flows through these areas of waterfalls and rapids, the water mixes together, which results in an average temperature throughout the entire depth of the river. In a dam system, the pools behind the dam will stratify, with warm water being in the top of the pool and cold water being at the bottom. These different gradients of water will separate and not mix within the pool. Dams often release water from the bottom which means that rather than having an average water temperature flowing down the channel, we now have a cold water release that can change the downstream ecosystem, pushing those fish that like warm water to other areas of the river. This will happen for both big hydroelectric dams and the smaller transportation lock-in dams. So far, we have talked about what happens within the river channels. Now let's talk about some of the changes that are happening outside of the channel that are influencing the water and flow within the channel. 
When we look at some of the big land management drivers that have had an influence on the Danube River, we should focus on what has happened in the region's forests, what farming has done to the landscape, and the industrialization and urbanization that has happened within the river basin. When we consider the forest environments along the Danube River, let's think about the black forests in Germany that we see today. In many places, like those shown on this image, we have a forest system of trees covering rolling hills. However, there is one thing on this picture that shows how changing in forest uses have resulted in changes to the larger system. In the lower right-hand corner of this picture, we have a small farmstead. It looks like a farmer who may graze some livestock. But as you can see, the changes from even this small clearing can have substantial impacts to the downstream river. In terms of how deforestation changes the landscape and the downstream watercourses, we see the following changes. When we remove the forests from the region, we have less vegetation on the site. With less vegetation, we have less evaporation from the plants, which means that more water moves along the soil surface rather than being returned to the air. We also have less chance for any individual raindrop to be intercepted by a leaf. This causes raindrops to have far more energy that can be very destructive to the soil. There can all, there's also less root mass, which means there are fewer avenues for the rain to enter the soil. Fewer roots also reduce the structure of the soil, making it less stable. The loss of trees will also change how water runs off the land. The tree stems and roots create a rough surface on the soil. As water moves over this rough surface, it has to run around or over any obstacles. This means that water will move slower as it travels to the stream channels. Removing the structural features of trees means that water can move faster over the landscape. With the changes to soil that happen from having less trees, the water has less chance to enter the soil and less chance to evaporate. This means that there is more water moving through the system, which can overwhelm the natural channels, resulting in localized and downstream flooding. Finally, the removal of trees and forest can result in greater erosion. This erosion can be soil that comes off the soil surface as the water runs towards the channel, or it can be high velocity water that cuts channels into the soil, resulting in mass erosion that can add massive quantities of soil to downstream areas causing a variety of problems. Here is an image of one of the Danube River tributaries. You can see there has been significant changes to the forest directly adjacent to the river. In these areas where the forests have been removed, there is often greater rates of erosion, while those that have forested banks should be more stable. In the distant past, this area of river would have been fully forested with minimal channel erosion. Recent scientific analysis has shown that clearing forests for agriculture started around 3,000 years ago in the lower part of the Danube River Basin. While there was some influence on water quality, it was not significant enough to really change the system. However, starting around 1,000 years ago, the rate of deforestation greatly increased, which resulted in much more sediment entering the river and a substantial increase in water. This change was large enough that it influenced the salinity in the Black Sea. Early removal of the forest was often done in the name of farming. The clearing of trees from the landscape opened rich and productive soils for food production for those who were moving into the Danube River Basin. In addition to food staple crops, livestock was introduced in the region for meat, milk, and cheese. Finally, we should also remember wine. Ah, the Danube wine community. While delightful, wineries are in agricultural lands and have an influence on the river. In relation to the Danube River, changing the landscape from long-lived herbaceous vegetation to annual crops has a major influence on soil structure. In this image, you can see the rooting cycle between a perennial grass on the right and a wheat plant. The perennial grass has a deeper root structure that lasts year over year. The wheat plant has a shallow root that dies each year and needs to regrow. This change from perennial vegetation to annual crops means the soil has less structure, which reduces water infiltration and soil stability. This means that cropped fields will have more runoff and be more susceptible to erosion than land that has a perennial plant community. Livestock are a valuable feature for the people and economy of the Danube River. There is little better than an afternoon slice of cheese paired with the right wine to set the mood for watching a sunset. 
However, the livestock that produce these trees are not without costs. With the introduction of livestock, we saw more deforestation, as trees were removed to increase the size of pastures. In addition, adding domestic livestock to the environment means that we're adding more nutrients to the water for manure. In addition, this manure also carries pathogens that are potentially harmful to humans. Finally, cows and sheep are heavy. They can compact the soil, increasing runoff, and they can trample the banks, increasing channel erosion. However, there are continuing efforts to keep the cows out of the river, so we are seeing lessening impacts from livestock directly on the banks or within the river itself. Another component of the modern farming system is the desire to reduce loss and increase growth. Those lovely grapes that produce the delicious Danube wines are susceptible to a variety of pests that reduce the crop output. Therefore, pesticides are used to control those annoying molds and fungi. Fertilizers are also used to increase growth and yield. These chemicals are not just used in vineyards. We can find these same chemicals used on farm fields. One of the challenges with these chemicals is that they are often carried into the river when it rains, causing pollution that affects water quality. In the previous slides, we talked about some of the modern farming practices. As we opened this section on farming, I spoke about clearing forests for agricultural production. In addition to clearing the forests in the Danube Valley, there is also a significant effort to reclaim land from the river's floodplain and converting that marginal land to productive farmland. This was done through the digging of drainage channels like the one pictured here. By removing water from the land, it dried out, making it more productive. However, as you can imagine, this additional drainage from the land went into the river, creating more downstream flooding, which required more flood control below areas in which the land was drained. As you can see, rivers are great systems for highlighting the law of unintended consequences. What we do in one part of the river will have results in other parts of the river. Some of those are predictable, others not so much. While deforestation and farming have significant influence throughout the Danube River, we should not discount the influence of the growth of cities and industries in the basin. The development and growth of high-density population centers and heavy industry have had a major influence on the river. After all, it was the people and their needs that dictate how we manage the river. With our modern technology and scientific understanding, we have a better awareness for how we influence the environment. We have plants that treat our human and industrial waste. However, in earlier days, the best way to get rid of human waste was to drain it to the river. The river served as a natural sewer, carrying human waste downstream and out of mind. This worked well, as long as you did not, did not live downstream of anyone who was dumping their waste your way. In this picture, we can see one of the challenges with modern urban living. The surfaces of many cities are covered in pavement, rock, or other solid material through which water cannot percolate. This means that water cannot infiltrate in the soil and must run off into sewers. This urban runoff means that water enters the river faster, again, increasing the potential for downstream flooding. With the lack of pervious surfaces into which water can infiltrate, we may see higher rates of flooding within the cities as well as in the river itself. If water cannot flow into a river and cannot soak into the soil, it sits. Enough of it, and it can result in scenes like this, where we have localized flooding in a city. Given a higher potential for increasing heavy rain events, we might see more scenes like this in our future. So, water flowing in a river is generally good. Water flowing down our city streets? Not so good. In addition to the growth of cities, there is a major growth of industrial areas. With the river serving as a transportation corridor and a supplier of water, it was natural for industries to grow next to the river. As with the disposal of human waste, the disposal of industrial waste by discharging it untreated to the river was also common. These discharges to the river made many segments of the Danube largely unsupportive of aquatic life and dangerous for swimming or even brief contact with human skin. We have looked at the geography and ecology of the Danube River, which shows how the river was formed. We then looked at the human influences over the river. So how does the Danube River of today look? Well, in some ways, there are still some significant challenges. In other ways, we have seen substantial improvements. 
However, as human behavior has changed, we are seeing new issues, such as increasing levels of antibiotics and other health and medical components entering the river. Over time, there has been a lot of contributors to pollution in the Danube River. Fertilizers and pesticides from farms, runoff and sewage from cities, toxic chemicals from factories, all of these have reduced the water quality in the Danube. Had past management practices continued, few would find the river so enjoyable as a recreational spot today. However, one of the amazing features of rivers is that they tend to be self-cleaning. With each rainfall or discharge from a spring, the river has a chance to move pollution down the channel. This does mean that the downstream portions of the Danube will take longer to clean up, but we are seeing substantial improvements over time. Starting our assessments of the water quality of the Danube system, let's look at the nutrient loads from chemicals such as phosphorus and nitrogen. These two chemicals are important because they influence the ecological structure of the river by producing excess vegetation growth. Major contributors of these two chemicals are urban runoff, farm runoff, and industrial outputs. Since the 1980s, we have seen overall reductions of these chemicals of the main stem, which has shown significant improvement at the outlet of the river in the Black Sea. These reductions are due to efforts by all the countries along the river to improve wastewater and industrial water treatment and improve farm practices. The trends for pollutants related to human and animal waste show the same patterns. The river is generally getting better largely due to improved treatment of sewage from cities and the control of livestock. The source of fecal materials continues to come primarily from the larger cities, with hotspots being concentrated around the major urban areas. Heavy metals and other hazardous substances continue to be a problem in the Danube River. Many of these materials come from industry and manufacturing, and others are carried into the basin from the burning of coal. Materials such as lead, mercury, and cadmium remain in the system for a long time because they do not break down into less toxic substances. In much of the river, even while the trend is improving, these hazardous substances can be found above safe levels. Another problem with these substances is that they bioaccumulate in the system. This means that when they get into plants, these plants are then eaten by herbivores, which are then eaten by predators, which are then eaten by larger predators. The larger predators wind up with a significant concentration of these hazardous substances in their flesh. As some of the top predators are eaten by humans, we can ingest these high levels of hazardous substances if we eat a lot of fish from the river. The Danube rivers carry much less sediment than it has in the past. In the upper river, the cost for the reduction in sediment transport is due to dams, which create pools where the sediment settles out. This can generally create clearer water. However, during floods, this sediment can be resuspended and cause problems downstream where it is deposited in unwanted places. In the downstream portion of the river, there is a sediment deficit due to the channelization and armoring of the riverbanks. The natural process of erosion and siltration has largely been suspended. This sediment deficit means the river is cutting down into its bed. There is also less habitat for wildlife because of the less structure in the river channel. The human changes to the river course have altered the assemblage of species living in the river. One of the biggest changes, and one of the hardest to remedy, is the installation of the many dams, which has harmed those species that migrate up and down the river. For many species, this loss of migration route has resulted in local extinctions. One of the species that is currently under threat is the sturgeon, which has a long history in the river basin and has much historical significance. Did you know that according to the International Commission for the Protection of the Danube River, the main stem of the river is generally safe enough to swim in? While there are a few hot spots that should be avoided, water quality has improved enough so that one can enjoy a leisurely swim, should one happen to fall out of a cruise ship. So if the Danube is getting better, where are the water quality challenges coming from? Well, it is not the main stem. The primary water quality challenges are coming from those rivers that are leading into the Danube. For example, the Teza River has a history of providing heavy metals to the main stem of the river. This is due to the industrial production that can be found in this tributary. And to make things even more challenging, it is not the main stem of the Teza where we can find challenges, but some of the smaller tributaries that feed into the Teza. 
This shows how polluting sources can be spread throughout a basin, often quite far from the site where we are measuring those pollutants. The Danube River, like any other river system, has fluctuating water levels. There can be periods of low water that make navigation of the channel impossible for most ships. Then there can be high water levels that make going under the bridges impossible. In its history, the Danube has had some major floods, such as the one commemorated by this memorial to the flood of 1838 in Budapest, that have caused major damage to the adjacent cities through which the river flows. When do we typically find high water on the Danube? We will usually find the highest water levels on the Danube in the spring, as the river is spread by snowmelt from the surrounding mountains. While we do find these times to be associated with high water levels, many of the tributary dams contain these high water levels, which moderates the water along the main stem of the river. When do we usually find low water levels on the river? Low water levels typically arrive in the summer, with the warmer summer months often leading to lower levels. As the Danube is fed by snowmelt and rainfall, changes to the patterns of these events will influence the water levels. In 2022, the Danube, along with many other rivers in Europe, was in the midst of a five-year drought. This drought has lowered the river level, making many forms of river transportation impossible. Many nations have taken to dredging the channel in an effort to keep the river open. This is an expensive process, but reflects the importance of the river to the economics of the countries through which it flows. Let's wrap up this longer than I anticipated presentation with a look at how the river is governed. The main stem of the Danube passes through 10 countries, including Romania, Hungary, Serbia, Austria, Germany, Bulgaria, Slovakia, Croatia, Ukraine, and Moldova. There are another 10 countries that lie within the river basin and have land that drain to the river, including Bosnia-Herzegovina, the Czech Republic, Slovenia, Montenegro, Switzerland, Italy, Poland, North Macedonia, Albania, and Kosovo. 20 countries is a lot of countries when trying to manage a river. Imagine trying to find a place to eat with 20 of your closest friends. Coming to an agreement would be a challenge for even the closest group of friends. Now imagine if those 20 people had very different personalities and tastes, and different budgets. That is what it is like to try to manage a river system with so many different countries. There are two organizations through which the nations come together to discuss the management of the Danube. The International Commission for the Protection of the Danube River provides a forum for which the members can discuss the water quality and quantity in the basin, including looking at issues of groundwater management. They also have an extensive monitoring program where they can gather data to better understand long-term trends and develop potential management strategies. The Danube Commission is an organization of states along the river that is focused on ensuring the maintenance of the navigability of the river to ensure that freight and passengers can safely and efficiently move along the length of the channel. Let's wrap this up. The Danube is a huge river in Europe that influences many countries, cities, and peoples. Flowing from the Black Forest in Germany to the Black Sea, the river carries people and freight, but also sediment and pollutants through much of Central Europe, surveys an economic lifeline and a major driver of tourism. Maybe you have been or will be on a river cruise somewhere along the Danube, or sat and watched the sun set over the river in Vienna or had your breath stolen by the beauty of the chain bridge spanning the river in Budapest. There are so many things to be enjoyed and to be amazed at in the Danube River Valley. While you are appreciating the human history and sights along the river, I encourage you to periodically look down and appreciate the water upon which you are sailing. It's a beautiful and complex system that deserves your wonder and awe. I hope that you enjoy this river as much as my wife and I did, and perhaps we will see you on the river one day in the future.